Well, hey friends, thank you so much for stopping by our channel today. What you're about to listen to is the most recent sermon preached and recorded live during a weekend service here at Chapel Springs Church. I invite you to subscribe to this channel right now. Head on over to our website, chapelsprings.org for more information and also check us out on social media. Thanks for being here. I'll catch you next time. In the era of judges, humanity stumbled in its search for righteousness. Each following their own flawed compass. But amidst the chaos, God raised unlikely people to guide them back to Him. Their tale echoes through time, reminding us of our perpetual need for a true King. That King is Jesus. Beckoning us to embrace his reign and rule. Well, we are in week five of our summer series, King Me, which is from the book of Judges. And last week I got us started in Gideon, and I'm going to finish his story here today. But just a reminder that Judges recounts the history of some of God's people when they, when they would turn from him and when they came under oppression and they'd cry out to God and God would send them a deliverer and he would raise up a judge who was a deliverer and set his people free and then they would end up back in bondage again eventually. And we're looking at just our tendency to go in this cycle and our tendency to king ourselves, to crown ourselves Lord of our own lives. And last week as I was talking about Gideon, one of the things I, I came to at the end was um, talking about the New Testament, we see Paul and some of the other New Testament writers, but especially in Paul, he's constantly reminding the early church to be watchful and be on alert. To be watchful and to be on alert. That we need to be alert to what's going on as we are in this spiritual battle. And I just want to lean into that again here today because there are going to be some things that come up in this text that as I've sat with this for a few weeks, I really sensed God sending a warning to me, to you, to us as a whole, as a church. I, I even told um, our deacon board a couple weeks ago about this week and that I, I sense God really warning us as we go forward here that we need to remain watchful. We need to remain alert. What happens is we tend to go through a crisis where we're very alert and then things get back to normal and we're not quite as watchful and prayerful as we were at the beginning of the crisis. That is human nature. And so I'm going to be pointing out a couple things here today that we really need to be watchful of. But let me remind you, um, since it's been a week, or maybe you weren't here last week, of Gideon. Gideon is our judge, our deliverer for this week. And um, I, I started his story last week by letting you guys know this was a man of fear. Like God appears to him and he is in absolute fear. He's, he's just a normal human. He's a very weak hum, human. But God chose Gideon to deliver his people from the Midianites. He didn't know God. He knew about him because he had heard the stories through his family, through God's people. But he hadn't learned himself how to perceive him. But once he does, God says, I'm going to have you deliver my people from their oppression. But first, before you do that, you need to destroy Baal's altar, which is in your father's home. And so we see Gideon go and destroy that altar. So it makes sense to us. We understand why he's part of God's people, but yet he doesn't really know God. It's because over time, they allowed the idols to come up and to be served right alongside the one true God. 
So Gideon doesn't know the power of the true God. And so Gideon destroys this altar. And my challenge for last week is that we, we take time to identify what the, the, the idols in our lives tend to be. And we all have them. We all have a tendency to run to them, to put them in the center of our lives. And I especially challenge you to really look at your families. What are some of the idols in our family life that we keep carrying on from generation to generation? So Gideon destroys Bell's altar, and then God tells him this. He says, you're to build an altar for me. Because, see, if we don't replace the idols with the one true God, another idol is just going to come along. We are created to worship. We are going to worship something or someone. So we have Gideon who builds God's altar. And then we see this. In Judges 6, verse 34, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. The Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. So after he destroyed, after he destroyed the the altar and he built the true altar in his home and he made God, the true living God, the center of his life again, God then sends the Spirit on him and we see Gideon blow the trumpet and he calls all of the men of his, of his clan to come and follow him as they go after the Midianites. So Gideon leads his army to victory as God brings about a midnight panic upon the enemy. And they end up turning their swords on one another. And then those who do survive, they drop the, they drop the swords. They drop the swords and then they run off. I'll let you read the details there in, in chapter 7 and 8. But here's something I want to point out. That God does something really interesting right before he sends the men into battle. Gideon has gathered all of these men, and God dwindles them down to only 300. And it doesn't look like it's the strongest among them. So he takes the 300, and he tells Gideon, okay, these are your guys, go. Go declare war. So they go, and they get the victory, but only because... It's God who causes the confusion to where the enemy turns on one another. They turn on themselves. And so what God does here is he weakens the Israelites. He weakens the army. And this goes back to our theme that we see over and over again in Judges, that God likes to use the weak. And he even says he's doing this so they can't boast. So that they can't, in the end, said, we did that. They knew they could not in any way have done what happened. That only God could have done that. So what happens as we move forward? Gideon changes. There's some kind of change that happens in him. It's subtle, and it's really easy to overlook in the text, but there seems to be a confidence that comes upon him, and I would say even a cockiness that comes upon him that we haven't seen in Gideon before. So as their men move forward, and they're going to go chase down those who has escaped, including the two kings of the enemy, he asked for a favor from the leaders of the clan of um, Sukkoth, and they tell him no. They say, he says, listen, I need you to help my men. My men need rest before we continue on. We're going to go get those kings, but my men need some food and some rest. And the town men said, no, we're not going to help you. And until you capture those kings, we don't believe you can, you can do this. You don't have them with you now. 
You haven't done what you need to do. So they lacked faith in Gideon and what he was trying to do. And look what Gideon says. Just for that, when the Lord has given Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, I will tear your flesh with desert thorns and briars. This is to God's own people that he's saying this. These are to fellow Israelites. So he goes on to the next town, the next clan, and he asks them the same favor. His men need rest. His men need food before they can go on. They, they want to go after these kings and the few that got away. They refuse for the same reason. They lacked faith. He hasn't proven himself. They're probably fearful. They've been under tremendous oppression. So what does Gideon do? He threatens them like he threatened the previous guys. So look at the irony of this. God found Gideon in a state of fear and doubt. Gideon didn't know God. He couldn't perceive God. He had no confidence in who God was. Remember, he kept asking for proof. He kept saying, God, prove who you are. If it's really you, do this. If that was really you, do this. And God was so patient. God was so kind. And he brought Gideon along. And here's Gideon, who's now dealing with people just like he used to be, yet he can't extend the same grace and patience. Gideon made it more about him when it wasn't about him. He made it about their lack of faith in him, and that hurt his ego. But really, it was about their lack of faith in God who just like him, didn't know or perceive the God of their ancestors. And isn't this what success often does? It tends to cause our human nature to forget where we came from. As we move forward in life, as we, we get more, as we go forward more, and we sense the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, sometimes we forget that it was the spirit of God and not us. We forget where we came from. We forget how he found us. And so it's not that God doesn't want us to have confidence. He, he wants our confidence to grow, but he wants our confidence to grow in him and not in ourselves. This is very different than what we're taught in our culture where we are obsessed with ourselves, our egos, and learning more and more and more about ourselves. So we, we think we're going to have more confidence in ourselves, and that's going to fix our problems. No, it's our confidence in God that needs to grow. And that's what's going on here. They have no confidence in God, but yet Gideon is making it about him. But our, our confidence must be rooted deeper and deeper in God. So as we look at Gideon, I, I want to remind you of this, to watch out for your human tendency toward pride when others lack faith in you. Watch out for your human tendency toward pride when others lack faith in you. This is so human. Our ego gets bruised. Listen, it's not up to you to prove yourself. You do what God's called you to do. Stay clothed in humility. Stay under the proper leadership and with other people surrounding you, speaking life into you, keeping you accountable, calling you out when maybe you need to be called out. But don't take offense because of pride. Pride. It's not you, it's God that they, they lack the faith in. So here Gideon was called to deliver God's people, but now he is taking revenge on them. Isn't that fascinating? He delivers them, and then he starts taking revenge on some of them because his 
pride has been hurt. So Gideon and his men, they carry on, they capture the two kings, they come back, and Gideon is faithful to his word. He takes the revenge on those Israelites that offended him. And then all of Israel comes together, and they celebrate the victory. Then the Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us. You, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. So the Israelites here, they are confident in Gideon as the one who saved them from Midian. But remember, God was simply using Gideon. It was his spirit that was on Gideon. It was not Gideon himself. But Gideon doesn't correct them. He takes the credit. And notice the contrast here between a few weeks ago, those of you who were here, and we talked about Deborah and Barak and the song that they, they sang at the end of the victory and how it gave glory to God, very different than what's happening here now. Gideon has forgotten that the only way he was able to defeat the enemy was through the spirit that had rested upon him. God had removed the numbers for the purpose that they wouldn't boast, and here they are boasting in Gideon, and Gideon is just receiving it. But Gideon does refuse to be their king because he knows that God wants to be their king. But look what he says. After he tells them, no, I won't be your king, he says, I do have one request, though, that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. So Gideon knows his theology. He knows that God wants to be the king. God does not want to establish an earthly king like the other nations. He wants to be their king. But yet Gideon still wants the benefit of a king. He still wants the gold. So we have him turning toward materialism, just like a king and the nations around him. And then we, we see him go on to obtain multiple wives and concubines, just like the kings of the nations around him. He even names one of his sons, which, by the way, one of his concubines he married was a Canaanite, completely against God's law. And he names one of his sons Abimelech, which means, my dad is king. My dad is king. <laughs> Gideon, what are you doing? The warning here, watch out for your human tendency to exchange a divine agenda for personal ambition. Watch out for your human tendency to exchange divine agenda for personal ambition. This is part of our human nature. Okay, Gideon's not alone in this. We are with him. We get this. We've done this. He starts off under God's divine agenda. This is what we see early in his life as you look at chapter 6. But then his agenda, his personal self-ambition, takes over in chapters 7 and 8. So he's gone from one extreme of not trusting God because he didn't know him to taking God's power for granted and taking the credit for what God did. And here's the fascinating thing. God disappears from the narrative. And it's easy to miss. When you're reading this story, starting in chapter 6, and you go on to chapter 7 and chapter 8, you get caught up in the story. 
and you'll miss the fact that God just slowly disappears. But isn't that how it is in our life? We get so caught up in our own story. We don't even realize that God's not as prominent as he used to be. We end up exchanging his story for our story. And we become the star of the narrative. And that's what happened with Gideon. So last week I, I mentioned some of the issues that we are seeing this, this straight out sin, sometimes even criminal behavior of church leaders. There's an exposure going on. I want to tell you, you can believe that God is behind exposing because he loves his people and his heart is for his very ministers to return back to his heart and to serve him. And I want to tell you that as a minister, and I have lots of friends who are in ministry, this stuff is really messing us up right now, and it needs to. There's something happening. The fact that there's so much exposure going on should let us know that God's getting ready to do something. He's getting ready to move in a powerful way but he's just needing to clean up his bride. And he's starting with his leaders. He's starting with the ministers. But I want to point something out that has really stood out to me over the years, and I want to say this. We do not help this situation when we look at ministers and we see their personal ambition, we see the exchange of the divine agenda for their personal ambition, but we classify it as, well, they're dreamers, they're visionaries. No, they have self-ambition. And we need to start calling it out. God is the one that gives us dreams and visions. And it's never us. It's never supposed to be about us. So we need to be careful. When we see leaders who are excessive in materialism, who are having tremendous sexual immorality, who just seem to lie and to cover. We need to call it for what it is. They're trying to prop up their own kingdom. They're under their own agenda. God help us. Church, we need to pray for what's going on because God, anytime we see something like this in church history happening, it's because God's making a major transformation in his church. We see it in the Reformation. Do you know the Reformation took a good hundred years for that transformation to happen? I don't know how long this one is going to take, but we need to lean in and allow God to do what he's going to do in us. Get us back on his agenda. We've got to get back to serving the body of Christ and the mission of God. There's a scripture that I, I, I return to over and over again, and it's in the Gospels. It's in a couple of the Gospels, I think Mark and Luke, where Jesus heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law. And this healing service breaks out in her home. And all these people come and, and they start to get delivered of demons and they get healed of disease. And, and it goes on late into the night and then people just kind of go to sleep. And then early in the morning, we're told that Jesus went away by himself to be with the Father and to pray. Then after some time, the disciples find him and they come up and they said, Jesus, where have you been? The crowds are back. 
People want you. We got to go back. There's people that need healed. There's people that need delivered. And Jesus says, no, it's actually my father's agenda that I move on to the next town and tell them that the kingdom of heaven is here right now. I can't stop in this one place too long. And it's not that their agenda was necessarily bad because there are people that needed healed and delivered. But Jesus knew he needed to go on. The father had business for him in the next town. And so he, he constantly kept that divine agenda before him when others were trying to pull him to where the success was, where the crowd was at. But Jesus knew that's not ultimately what it's about. And I could see where Jesus could say, well, but that doesn't make sense. Like people need me. But he was submitted to the Father's agenda. When we exchange God's agenda for our own ambition, we end up creating idols. We read in Judges 8 that Gideon placed the gold into an ephod where he placed in Ophrah his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. An ephod was a garment worn by priests in God's presence, and Gideon places it in his town instead of the worship center in Shiloh, which is where the priests would have been. Gideon's self-ambition ends up affecting his family for generations. And you can read this in chapter 9. And in effect, it affected God's people for generations, leading them to worship Bel again. So here Gideon gets called to deliver his people, to deliver God's people from the oppression and he smashes the altar to Bell at the beginning of the, his ministry. But here he is at the end. And he basically leads them back into Bell worship again. I want us to go into communion right now. If you didn't grab one of the elements, just raise your hand. We have open communion here at Chapel Springs, which means you do not need to be a member, but you need to be willing to come humbly in the presence of the Lord so the Spirit can examine you. In 1 Corinthians, Paul, Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. Idolatry was everywhere just like it had been during Gideon's time and just like it is in our time. It looks different now, but it was alive and well during the first century. And Paul addresses this in 1 Corinthians, especially in, chapters, in chapter 10, because it caused a lot of confusion because the idolatry was so big that there was lots of sacrificing of animals and the meat would be sold in the marketplace. So the question for the Christians became, can we eat the meat that was sacrificed to idols? And I won't go in and deal with all of that here today, but the point is they were dealing with some serious issues. And Paul's shepherding them. He's trying to help them through this very important question. And one of the things he says is, you know, you need to think of others and don't eat it if it's going to cause another believer to stumble, if it's going to cause anyone else to stumble. 
You may not have sacrificed it to the gods, but if you go somewhere and they give it to you and they, they tell you this was sacrificed for the God, he, he's like, yeah, be careful. You could cause someone to stumble. And he goes on to say to them, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Everything, every small detail. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. And he uses the table of the Lord to emphasize how we are one. And that what we do when we come to the the table of the Lord, what we do affects one another. What we do from day to day in the small things, in the big things, it affects other people. We're not an island. And so what I want us to do today is we come to the table and we receive the body of Christ. I want us to consider every detail of our lives. Is it for the glory of God? And if it's not, then whose glory is it for? So I'm going to just give us some space here. And if you want to find a place, you can stand to your feet. You can remain seated. You can come to the floor. Just posture yourself before God. And I want you to allow the spirit to search you. Who's being glorified in the small and the big things of your life? How are the details of my life impacting the next generation of believers? Do you know you are here today because someone lived faithfully? Someone pointed in their day-to-day life to the living God. We don't know who the next generation will, will be after us, but we have an impact on them. So are the details of my life of worship impacting the next generation of believers? How is that happening? And it especially pertains to your own family, your children's children's children that you may never know. But even the small details that are pointing to God from day to day will impact them. So if it's not pointing to God, who's it pointing to? If it's not leading to God, who is it going to lead them to? So I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians. And when you are ready, you can receive the elements. But I just want you to give the space to God that he needs to poke around, to mess around in your life. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So Lord, we come before you right now. Lord, smash the idols. Redirect us to the Father. Lord, as we receive the bread and the juice, may we be reminded of your grace and your forgiveness. Lord, may we be reminded of the empowerment of your spirit that helps us walk day to day in your kingdom. So Lord, have your way in us, speak to us each right now.
Jesus' name. Jesus at the center of it all, and Jesus at the center of it all, from beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing else matters. living on a 
farm this summer. And the farm has um, really big livestock dogs. And they told me when I moved in, um, they said, when you come, whatever you do, don't turn your back to them. And definitely don't run. And so I was a little freaked out when I pulled up. I've, I've become friends with these dogs. But they wake me up in the middle of the night. Usually a couple times a night I hear them. As they have predators who are lurking about trying to get to the sheep or the chickens. And not long after moving in, I, I sensed like God woke me up in the middle of the night to hear it that first time. I sensed God say, stay watchful, Stephanie. Stay alert. You are in a spiritual battle. And I sense it's a warning, not just for me, but for all of us in our individual lives, but as a whole, as a church. You know, we went through a crisis last year, and it would be easy to not be as desperate, right? But we're going to remain watchful. We're going to pray like we were praying a year ago. We're going to lean into the presence of God. We're going to come alongside one another and encourage each other to stay watchful, to stay alert. We need to be praying for one another. Pray for me. Pray for our leadership team. Let's be people on watch. Stand to our feet. Go palms up. Lord, we are yours as we head into a new week. Empower us by your spirit. God, keep our ears and our eyes open to be alert to your spirit, to be alert to what's going on, even in the unseen realm. God, give us eyes to perceive what you're doing. Lord, may we love others well this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful week.